My name's Sarah. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Pandemona. Um, I've been at Twitter for almost four years now, and uh, for most of my time here, I've, I've been working on Twitter for Android. And um, as of March, I started working on um, Vine for Android. Um, I went to the University of Waterloo. Anybody here from the University of Waterloo? Holler, yes, awesome. We are slowly and silently taking over Silicon Valley. Um, uh, so uh, don't be surprised if you see more of us, uh, lots of us coming soon. OK, so I'm here to talk about Vine. Um, in case you don't know, Vine is our six second video product. Uh, allows you to take cuts of um, video on your phone, and it uh, puts them together and uh, provides you with a six second looping video experience. Anyone here not use Vine? All right, well, maybe after. <laughs> I see some Twitter employees that are raising their hands. I don't know what you guys are doing, but. Um, <laughs> so Vine started uh, from these three guys, Colin, Russ, and Dom. These are the founders. And they wanted to build a tool that would allow you to easily cut video shoots together. Uh, that was it. That was their goal. And um, it crashed a lot, but they gave it to their friends to see uh, you know, if, it was, if it was fun and useful. And um, everyone liked it. Um, and it began with kind of like an unlimited time uh, to shoot video, uh, but it became pretty clear very quickly that if it's going to have a social component, a component, it's got to be faster. It's got to be more bursty. Social interactions are really bursty. Um, so they started playing around with a time limit and um, ended up uh, on six seconds. It turns out you can actually tell a pretty compelling story in six seconds. And if you think about, you know, a standard Vine format of two second, three two second clips, you can have like a beginning, a middle, and an end in, um, in six seconds. Um, and then the other thing that um, they, uh, they added was to make the video actually loop. And the six seconds combined with the loop gives the Vine this rhythm that is really unique to the product, and it's really what makes Vine viney. Um, these two things also make the technical constraints very interesting, as we'll see um, in, a, in a moment. But um, that's kind of the inspiration behind uh, these, the six-second looping video. So I'm going to set the stage for you a little here. Uh, this is going to be mostly about my experience building Vine in a very short period of time. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not going to claim that it's perfect. It's certainly not. Uh, but uh, we did get it out there, and um, you know we, we have a we have a we have a long way to go. But uh, it's it's been a very much very much a learning experience. So when um, when we launched Vine, uh, the iOS version, uh, that was uh, January 24th of this year. We launched on iOS only, and you know, Android people like me are kind of like, what the? <laughs> How can you do that uh, and uh, you know leave half of your market? And in January, it was just about uh, reaching half of the market um, out of the out of the loop. But the, the reality is, is we had no idea um, how Vine was going to be used, and you know the success of the product um, was really something we couldn't predict. And you know we had thought about this this you know three times two second format, which was like really popular when you when you first use Vine. Um, but since then, people have been immensely creative with the product, doing stop motion, and people are, have become really, really good at like the full six-second clips that like actually uh, can tell, tell a whole story without doing a cut. Um, that's all the kind of stuff that you know we had invested too much up front uh, and failed. It would have been a huge, uh, uh, it would have been a huge disappointment. So I think that was the right thing to do, um, even though I am an Android person. Um, so Android work became, began in late March of this year. I uh, moved to New York for the duration of the, proje the project and a little longer. Um, and the strategy here was like, all right, Vine successful. At the time, it had, um, uh, 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 I think, 13 million. Well, it was 13 million when we ended up launching. But um, the strategy here was like, guns blazing, full steam ahead. This is Sparta. Get me an Android app. Like that was the attitude, and we were like, "All right, what what are we? What are the things we're going to do? What compromises are we going to make? We got to get this out there as soon as possible." Um, I had a search going for a Vine for Android on my TweetDeck, and it, the, the velocity of that timeline was like really fast. And everyone's like, "You guys suck. Why don't you have an Android app?" And so there was definitely like the public pressure that I could see every day. It was my, um, you know, my motivation to get up and work every morning was uh, was definitely there. So we succeeded, and we launched uh, June 3rd of this year. 
just a, you know, a couple, two and a half months basically after we had started. Um, and uh, we launched to ICS uh, and uh, for Google and Amazon um, markets. Okay, so we began this journey of building Vine for Android. Um, and at the time, I was working on Twitter for Android, which I had been working on for a couple years. So I ended up pulling a lot of uh, the plumbing, uh, network layer stuff, uh, you know, network retries, that kind of that kind of code. A lot of the you know the list view code that we had. There's a lot of custom list view code in in Twitter that I ended up pulling. So I was lucky to have a, a lot of that to bootstrap the Android, uh, the Vine Android app. And um, it, the design itself was heavily inspired by the pure Android version of Twitter, which at the time wasn't released. But we, um, it's it, you know it it allowed us to have like a nice consistent feel over both of the apps and have it be pure Android as well. So Vine, as I mentioned, um, you know, six seconds looping video. Uh, we're going to talk about all of that. Um, in terms of playback, the playback requirements were um, pretty clear. The Vine had to autoplay. So the video has to autoplay. Um, it has to be in some kind of a timeline layout where you can scroll up and scroll down and pull the refresh and all the things that you've come to expect from a, a basic uh, you know, uh, sharing something app. And um, of course, had to be um, continuous looping. So for autoplay, the spirit behind the autoplay is that it has to have a, a magically moving image. And that's why we put the thumbnail up there first. And that's why the thumbnail is the first frame of the video. And that way, you know, you're scrolling up and down. You only see this, the thumbnail. And once the, the video is in you know, the center or in a place where it should play, it kind of magically starts moving. And that's the kind of spirit that we want to capture in the autoplay. And it's not as simple as being like, you know, sure, well, when the video is in view, just play it. Uh, because you, know, you want to have the thumbnail up there. You want to prefetch the next couple videos so that if they scroll there, those videos have already downloaded. And you kind of get this feeling of like, oh, it's like just magically moving because I moved to it. So we actually prefetch two videos ahead. Um, and um, we played a lot with the screen ratio, um, how much of the video needs to be on the screen before it's the one that you want to see. And how does that transfer over if you're on the Kindle Fire or if you're on the Nexus 7? And by no means is that logic perfect. Uh, but that's definitely something that we consider in, in trying to make it feel more magical, for lack of a better word. Questions so far? Cool. OK. The timeline itself, um, I mentioned uh, we were able to leverage some of the Twitter for Android code. Um, we used the refreshable list view that Twitter for Android has that does the pull to refresh and all of that. We modified it slightly for our needs, changed a few of the assets, changed a little bit of the behavior. But for the most part, it you know pull to refresh, you get new stuff. Scroll to the bottom, you get the old stuff. Um, to actually place the video in the feed, uh, we started off using the surface view, um, which seemed to work pretty well if you had one of them. But as soon as you wanted to have more than one of them, um, it turns out the documentation says you should never really use Surface View in more than one Surface View at a time, uh, which we discovered very quickly. And the Surface View doesn't really play very well with z-indexes. Z so when you scroll, it starts overlapping stuff that you, you know, it should not be overlapping. Um, so we ended up using a texture view, which is what uh, I think you should use in this case. And um, it behaves much more like a standard Android view. OK, so looping. Should be as simple as media player dot set looping true, right? It's got a media player. There's a looping variable. You can switch it. Seems pretty. Seems pretty good. So I want to show you a couple of vines um, to illustrate why this actually didn't work for us. Um, I'm going to show you a vine on an, on an iPhone. It's me recording it playing on an iPhone, really. And um, it's it's a it's like hashtag guitar nose. So if you look at Vine and you look at hashtag guitar nose, basically someone has taken their phone, put it at the nose of their guitar, and they're doing a little riff. And if they've done it right, then they can loop it perfectly so it sounds like they're just continuously like riffing. Um, and I'll show it to you on the iPhone. I'll also show it to you on the Droid Razor. Um, media player dot set looping true is actually OK on some of the faster phones, like the S4. But it's really the, the problem is really pronounced on the, on the Droid Razor, um, which uh, Harder a few months ago was my was my primary phone. I'm ashamed to admit, but it's a good phone. Um, so I'll show you what it looks like there, and then I'll, I'll uh, we'll talk about it some more. So here's what it looks like on the iPhone. And um, listen closely. You may not hear the loop, but you're gonna hear six seconds of video. It's gonna loop, and and then a few more seconds after that. 
very quick, but pretty seamless. So that's how it is on the iPhone. So here it is, uh, Droid Razor, media player, set looping true. <laughs> oh, not cool, not cool. Um, and this becomes even more pronounced if you've got a lot of background audio. So you're at a bar or you're at a concert and there's kind of like this steady state of background noise. Um, and I would have shown you like one of those, but you guys would get really annoyed when I have to show it to you the third time uh, for a bar scene. I think the, the gu guitar is a little more palatable. Um, so that was gonna be not acceptable for us. Uh, the loop, the magical loop of Vine is kind of like part of the, uh, the DNA. So we tried a few things. What we really wanted to achieve was a, a smoother, sexier loop. Um, so what we ended up doing is uh, we set a timer to go off um, that uh, lives alongside the media player uh, about every 30 milliseconds. And when that timer goes off, we check to see if we're near the end of the video. And if we're 250 seconds, milliseconds left, um, if there are 250 milliseconds or less left at the end of the video, um, we make a call to seek, seek to start. And um, by the time the media player actually reacts to that, it tends to be pretty good. Uh, so um, I'll show you what this looks like, on, again, on the Droid Razor. And um, you know, different phones, uh, the media player is going to react to uh, different, uh, is going to have a different reaction speed on, on different phones. So it's not, it's not fantastic on the Droid Razor, but you can see what it looks like. So it's not as great as the iPhone, but uh, this was an acceptable compromise. Um, and on a faster phone, it, it, it loops uh, quite a bit tighter than that as well. But you don't have the jarring media player set loop issue. Are yes. The question is, are we buffering any of it? The answer, are we buffering any of the keyframes? The answer is no. We're using the standard media player here. So there's nothing, there's nothing really custom going on here other than we're seeking to start as we <coughs> approach the end of it. Yeah, exactly. Cool, okay, now let's talk about recording. So the recording requirements were up to six seconds of video, cuts of varying length, and um, one of the most important things, um, the start and stop of the video cuts have to match uh, your thumb movement. So if you're not familiar with Vine, um, the way it works is the video recorder comes up, you put your thumb on the screen, while your thumb's down, it's recording, and there's a green progress bar filling up. You lift your thumb up, you stop recording. And we got to make that as exact as possible and match your, your, your movements as much as possible. So, should be pretty easy. We've got a media recorder in Android, media recorder.start, media recorder.stop. Why not? Um, so, I'm going to illustrate what happens um, when you just use the media recorder. And we're going to think of uh, the horizontal, uh, the x axis as time, um, getting uh, bigger on this side. And um, the media recorder is going to try to illustrate the green bar filling up, and then there's going to be lines for video and audio as they begin recording. So this is what happens with the media recorder. You start, and then the audio and video kick in. And then you stop, and then the audio and video stop. And it turns out there's about a 700 millisecond delay on both sides, on both sides. And for, you know, your, your user is only expecting to shoot six seconds of video, uh, that was an absolute deal breaker. There was no way we were going to use um, the native uh, media recorder like this, and it wasn't going to support stop motion. We need to be able to get one frame cuts. If you can tap it fast enough, we need to be able to get one frame cuts in order to support stop motion. So, um, you know, really what makes Vine Vine is, is, is these elements, you know, the be able to take really short cuts and be able to loop it, and uh, it, was a, it was a sad day when we looked at this and we were like, Okay, it turns out the camera provides this callback called on preview frame. So if you think about when you launch your camera in your, you know, your, native, um, your, 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 native, uh, your native phone camera, 
Um, even if you're about to take a video, you move your phone around and you can see the previews, the preview on the phone changes, obviously, when you go to shoot, um, to shoot video or to take a photo. There is a callback uh, that you can listen to called on preview frame. So every time an image is pushed to that, um, to the camera, um, you, can, uh, you can grab it. Um, and the latency on that is really small. You're basically getting these preview frames immediately. So to illustrate what it's supposed to look like, you know, we want to start recording and have the audio and video start and stop at the same time. Um, so what we can do is use the on preview frame callback to grab the images and separately record audio and then maybe try to jam them together. So what happens is the audio samples come back at a nice rate at which you would expect them to come back. Um, they are at, at, the, at the frequency that you would expect them to be. And uh, that's just using the standard audio controller. No, no problems with the standard audio controller. And the video, the on preview frame callback kind of actually comes out like this. So even though it's 30 frames per second, sort of on average, uh, it's not really coming back that way. And um, it really depends what your phone is also doing in the background. If your phone's like busy, if you're, you know, if the Google Play app is like updating 30 apps at that time, uh, this is going to be, this, this uh, frequency is going to look really, really bad. So um, with not a lot of options, this is the route we decided to take, and we decided to manually um, synchronize the audio and the video. So this is a kind of um, gnarly process. I'm not going to get too detailed into um, the edge cases, but the general idea is you take the timestamps of each audio and video sample as they come in. Um, and then in on preview frame, the incoming video timestamp is ahead. Uh, chill with the video and record a little bit more audio. And uh, if the audio timestamp is ahead, then adjust the video timestamps. The audio timestamps are the source of truth. So you're not going to adjust those ones. But you'll adjust the video timestamps. And you're also, you're also going to keep track of an ongoing offset and kind of adjust as necessary. Those are the, ki that's the, kind of, those are the heuristics we follow. And then we kind of shove in a lot of edge cases in there to, to make it work. And turns out, most cases, most of the time, it's actually pretty good. Um, and if your phone is, um, has enough memory allocated uh, to the process, um, it ends up being a, a, pretty smooth, um, a pretty smooth experience. So I'm going to backtrack a second here. You know, Most of the time, um, when you're building an app, you're thinking about your memory footprint, and you're, you're trying to make things as efficient as possible, and you're trying to lower your memory footprint. In this particular case, in order to get an audio video recording that is going to be optimal for the user. It's going to be the, the user does not want something that's not synced. We actually have to allocate a lot of memory, and we have to try as much as possible to guarantee that we have that memory. And as soon as we're done, we'll release it. But it's kind of the opposite um, mindset of um, trying to you know, be super efficient on the memory here. Memory here is the best, is the best thing that we have. So what we do is um, every cut is recorded in memory. And um, the audio and video is combined as you go. So as you continue to record, we're, we're starting to um, already combine the audio and video. Um, but what this ends up meaning is for a full six second cut, you may need about 140 megabytes of memory on a faster device and um, about 170 on a slower device. And the reason why you need more on a slower device is because we can't free up that memory fast enough because the slower device doesn't process the audio video combination fast enough. So um, more memory has to be um, allocated for the future processing, if that makes sense. So if you are taking a Vine and you're taking one cut and then you take another cut and then you take another cut, um, the final processing time is going to be faster than if you took a full cut because in between when you're deciding what your ne cut, next cut's going to be, we've already started to um, combine the video and the audio. Um, so on some phones, um, even a full se six second cut, the, the processing time is uh, not terrible on my S4, which I have now. It's like pretty fast on the Droid and the Droid Razor. It's like a little painful, but um, this is this is kind of the reality. Um, so as I just mentioned, if you have more cuts, then the final processing time is is less. So how do we actually manage this memory? So memory is allocated in step one. That's why on some phones it takes a really long time to boot the camera. We are allocating memory at that time. 
if, you, um, if we can't allocate enough memory, we can't really guarantee that you're going to be able to take a video, so we have to do it uh, in step one. Um, we see a lot of out of memory issues. Um, generally, if you get a crash because the Android didn't want to give us enough memory, uh, if you just do it again, it'll be fine the second time. Uh, that kind of sucks. Uh, working, on, working on that. Um, we obviously set large heap to true to try to get more memory, and we actually run the recorder on a separate process, and that way Android will give us a separate memory allowance for that as well. Um, yes? Uh, the question was, have we considered using the, uh, the Dart, Dart, memory Dart memory controls, the Chrome, like the Chromium browser stuff, um, to uh, better do the memory management? And um, maybe we will. It sounds like you're, you're giving me a thumbs up, so that sounds like a really good idea. Um, OK, so we run the recorder on a separate process. And also, uh, while I'm here, um, the uploading, um, the act of uploading Vine also runs on a separate process. So we, uh, we run three processes. Um, OK, so uh, to paint the picture of everything going on here, um, we, when we start the video recorder, we allocate um, buffers, and we use a heuristic to determine how many buffers to allocate. Um, and then you're recording, you're pausing, you're recording. Each time, you know, if you're, each time we see anything, any video or audio coming in, we're trying to process it as fast as possible. Um, and then we launch you into the preview. So uh, that's when you get to, get to see the Vine that you, um, that you actually created, determine whether or not you want to post it. And then finally, you post it. So that step right here um, is the one that ends up being expensive because uh, depending on how many frames we got to process while you were taking the Vine, this is where you're going to sit and wait for the rest of the frames to get processed. And um, this step is potentially expensive as well, especially if you're on a crappy internet connection. This is where we have to actually upload your file to the servers. So one of the optimizations that we do is we, uh, we actually start uploading here as soon as the preview is ready. And um, that removes like that last part. Um, so uh, hopefully by the time you've posted, it's actually, in fact, already uploading. Make sense? Cool. OK, more optimizing. So um, you guys are all Android devs. I, I don't claim to have like an expert knowledge of how every single app is doing, um, their, uh, doing their stuff. But from what I can see, a very general way to grab data and show it on the screen uh, kind of looks like this. You fetch the remote data. That's your, that's your app over there. You're fetching the data from a, a server. Uh, it comes back. You write it to disk. Maybe you're using a content provider if you're really eager and astute. Um, so you write it to disk, you notify some kind of content change, uh, and then you know somehow the UI gets notified, a cursor gets swapped, and UI gets updated. Yes, this looked like a familiar pattern, kind of generally what we do. Um, so unfortunately, this is like really slow. And um, uh, when you're dealing with, you know, we do this a lot on Twitter, and for the most part, it's okay. But uh, you know, we're already making you wait to download like three or four videos when you launch the app if you if you have um, new videos in your feed. So we wanted to see what we could do to try to speed this up. Um, we could not write to DB and just uh, grab the server information and put it on the screen for you. Um, but we really wanted to have something for you to look at while new videos are coming in, or if the, the new the new vines are coming in. And we also wanted you to have somewhat of an offline experience. So didn't really want to do that. Um, so what we ended up doing was um, creating this like hybrid cursor, which kind of does uh, both, both jobs at once. So this cursor is like agnostic to whether or not it's being backed by DB rows or by an in-memory array list kind of thing. Um, and basically, you know, if you're using the cursor loader pattern, uh, uh, this, this cursor kind of takes away all of the, uh, the gnarliness that might be, uh, you, you might need to do to like merge DB rows with, with uh, in-memory rows coming back from, from the server. So communication with this cursor is fun. Extending cursor wrapper is, uh, extend, extending cursor wrapper is, well, isn't the most uh, easy thing to extend because you can't really communicate with the cursor. In fact, the only way you can really communicate with it is by using the get extras method. Um, in, 
if you're not looking to use like cursor.getLong or, or cursor.getImage or whatever to pull data out of the cursor. So in order to actually support this hybrid cursor that can handle um, stuff coming in from the DB and stuff coming in from um, stuff coming in remotely, uh, the cursor is actually just backed by an array list. And when you read from the DB, it's processed and put into the array list. So this cursor kind of handles both. Um, and because now it's an array list, you can't actually use cursor.get whatever. Uh, so you got to use cursor.get extras. So there's no way to actually talk to the cursor. Um, you, there's a way to get stuff out of it. But I, I was in a situation where I'm like, I need to do something conditional. And my cursor can't actually listen to me. Uh, turns out there's a method for that, which has been around since API 1, but in all of my Android work, I've never actually used until now. It's called respond, which is a little unintuitive. And you can put useful stuff in there, and you can override cursor.respond and do whatever you need in there. Um, sorry if that was uh, not super clear, but long, long story short here is we have a cursor that will take data from the um, server and display it to you uh, right away, whoops, sorry. And in parallel, write that data to DB, so you're not waiting for the DB write in order to, to update your view. Cool, I see some nods, does that make sense? Okay, tools and environment. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what our environment looks like. That's what my desk looks like in New York. Um, phones and plants everywhere. Uh, that's like naughty, that's exactly how I would describe Vine, in fact, just phones and plants everywhere. Um, so we built most of this using IntelliJ and just a few weeks ago switched to Android Studio and Gradle, which has been really cool so far. I feel like we're rejoining the Android community and moving there, um, which has been cool. Um, we've used a variety of phones in developing. Um, we try to have as many phones on site as possible. We actually didn't really use the emulator Turns out videos don't play in the emulator. So <laughs> anything that you want to do for testing, looping, recording, whatever, um, is kind of a no-op. Uh, so sorry, Android emulator. We did not find you useful. Um, the other thing that we did find useful, though, is Crashlytics. Does anyone here use Crashlytics? So Crashlytics is, um, uh, is a tool that can give you real-time crash reporting data. Um, if I may say a little bit better than the Google Play uh, crash reporting, uh, actually a lot better than the Google Play crash reporting, and you can also do um, some custom things with it. So Crashlytics very quickly became part of our routine. This is basically how, um, how me and, and the Android engineers on Vine push code. We uh, get our APK together, it's tested, whatever. We push it to, to Google Play, and uh, then we watch Crashlytics uh, for the latest build number to see what crashes come in. And uh, if there's anything like Harry in there, that's like obviously developer error, some null pointer exception or whatever, because Google Play releases to everyone so slowly, uh, we can catch that really fast and then release a hot, fix it and release the hotfix right away. Um, and then maybe only a small percentage of you just saw that. Um, so it's become part of our routine. We watch it intently. Um, it's instant, real time. Uh, it gives you tons of metadata. And you can also log um, non-fatal issues, which is awesome. So if I want to know, like there's some like weird edge case that I'm just going to fail gracefully from. I obviously don't want to, um, I don't want the user to crash in this like certain case. Um, I can actually do, actually put in a Crashlytics non-fatal log in there and count how many people are actually going in there. Is it five people? Is it five million people? Um, so that's, uh, that's been really, really helpful. And you can also log whatever other metadata you want with it. And I'm really happy to say like we have zero unknown crashes. And what I mean by that is, when we do a launch, don't get me wrong, we get a lot of crashes, but we understand all of the ones that come in, why they're coming in. It's you know, out of memory stuff, or yeah, it's that gnarly case over there that we don't really know how to fix yet, or we haven't fixed yet. But all of the crashes that come in, we know um, why they happen and um, the fact that they're happening. And if we ever see an unknown crash, we can fix it right away. So every time. Like I know basically when all of you guys get the Vine app after I push it because I start to see the known crashes come in. So it's like super easy to put uh, in your app. Um, to start Crashlytics is one line, uh, crashlytics.start. And um, just to show you some of the, the power of it. So here's a, a 
code sample. Sorry if it's too small for you guys to see, but I'll just explain. So in the main timeline for Vine, uh, there's a lot of tap targets. Yeah? I don't know how I feel about that, but there's a lot of tap targets. There is at mentions, there's hashtags, and they're green, and they're bold, and you tap on them, and they take you to different profiles and whatever. And we use spans to, to decorate those. Uh, so you have a certain text view, and you throw link spans, color spans, whatever, to, uh, um, to decorate those. Um, we have a few bugs, um, and we fixed most of them by now, but there's definitely still a few that are outstanding. We have a few bugs uh, with emoji. And uh, you know when, when those iPhone guys put emoji into their vines and Android has to deal with it, uh, we have some like uh, indexing bugs when it comes to setting the spans and when we have to count emoji. It's not, it's not super straightforward. Um, but we don't want to crash on an index out of bounds exception because that would suck. Uh, so we check to see if the, if the, the, the indices in indices are within the bounds of the span. If they are, go ahead and set them. If not, do it anyway, catch it, and mark a crash analytics log. So that's, that's a, I wouldn't say a common pattern that we do, but we do that sometimes so that we can uh, at least have an idea of how often this is happening and maybe how, how high priority it is for us to fix it. Cool? Okay, the F word, fragmentation. Wouldn't be a true Android talk without talking about a little bit of fragmentation. So, <coughs> I mean, I, I, I feel like I went through some fragmentation stuff while working on Twitter for Android. Uh, it was nothing compared to the fragmentation issues having, uh, having worked on Vine. Although, I think what I found is that um, the fragmentation issues ended up exposing more bugs in my code. It's just that the different device exposed something that the other device couldn't, if that makes sense. Um, there were definitely some things that were very device specific. But for the most part, we were able to get around some of these fragmentation issues by being very generic. Be like, well, if you have this much RAM available to me, then behave this way, otherwise behave that way. Or if you have this many cameras, do this, otherwise do that. Um, we didn't have to do anything too device specific. It was more kind of behavioral or attributes of, of, um, of what, uh, what we had available to us. However, there were definitely a few things. The Samsung S4 front-facing camera does not properly report its, uh, its size. Uh, so when we launched the front-facing camera, the Samsung S4 was warped. The Moto X does the same thing. This is super annoying. Um, and it, I don't know what the situation is. They just did not implement that API properly. So there's that kind of stuff. HDCs don't like multiple media players at once. We have to do a few hacks to get that, uh, get that to, to behave nicely. Um, no other phone had that issue, really. Uh, Kindle, well, <laughs> we got a long way to go on the Kindle. Um, we're working really closely on Amazon. Kindle behaves differently than ever, any phone that we have, period. Uh, we're, we're still, it is a whole different beast. Um, we do push updates to Kindle. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't like us very much. Uh, we're working on it. So we ran into this thing working with all these devices, which is like, what is, what is the meaning of a default camera? Uh, which is maybe something you don't really think about, but we, uh, we had to really um, dive deep into this. On you know, an Nexus 7, it might be the front-facing camera. On the Kindle, it might be the front-facing camera. Uh, but on your regular phone, the default camera is the back-facing camera. So turns out um, it's up to the manufacturer to report which one is front-facing and back-facing. So uh, you know, some phones with only front-facing cameras will report that as a back-facing camera. That's kind of gnarly, um, especially when you want to see if you can switch between front and back facing. Uh, that one we kind of had to do some one-offs there to be like, well, if you're this phone, we know you have two cameras and this one should be front and that one should be back. So basically, um, when you launch the app, we keep track of all the cameras. We start with the ones that report to be back facing and move to the ones that report to be front facing. And when we actually launch the recorder, we go through them until we find one that safely opens. Okay. So just, that's just a handful of some of the fragmentation issues that, that we had. Um, in terms of the operating system, like we have a bunch of statements in the code that's like, if you're jelly bean, then do this. If you're ice cream sandwich, then do that. For the most part, didn't have too much of an issue there because we only supported jelly bean and ice cream sandwich. Okay, so after launch, um, 
launch happened June 3rd of this year. It was uh, the most stressful day of my life, but it was awesome. Um, following that, we deployed major releases weekly for uh, five weeks, which was crazy. Uh, it was crazy time. If we thought building the app was crazy time, this was crazy time. Um, we finally reached feature parity with iOS last week, which was a huge milestone for us. Uh, we've worked really hard to get to get here, and we're like really happy that we can just be on par now with um, with iPhone. And Vine announced last week that they we have 40 million uh, users now, which is a huge jump from when we launched Android. Thank you. Uh, the question is, what's the split across from OS's? I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Um, this is the team. There's me, Edison, who's the mastermind behind um, a lot of our a lot of our video work. Um, Matt Jama and Ryan Gordon, who just came on. Uh, these are the guys that are. Uh, this is your Vine for Android team right there. Uh, okay. Huge thanks to Twitter, to Vine, uh, to the Twitter University guys helped put this together. Carolyn, Ryan Swigart, that random guy over there whose vines I stole for the demo. Um, questions. If, you, if this interests you at all and you're, you're thinking about working at Twitter or uh, working at Vine, twitter.com slash jobs or I'm here. I know Judy was here. She's a recruiter. I saw her face earlier. Um, but yes, ask anything. Thank you. So the question is, how do they settle on six seconds as a, uh, as a benchmark, um, given that it started with an unlimited amount of time? Um, so they actually played with varying lengths of video. And six kind of felt right. Um, they played with 10. They played with five. Six was, I think, a, a, they said was a, a good, uh, it, it felt right. And it felt right with the loop. Um, to have something that looped too quickly kind of got dizzying. To have something that was too long and loop was kind of exhausting. And six seconds just felt really good. It was very intuitive. Um, one of the things that Russ often says to me, he's one of the, the, the founders, he's, he's, yeah, I've heard him say this a couple times, is that uh, when you look at a music video, something that's being shot from many angles and you, you're kind of seeing a lot of different parts of a scene or something, every scene, every cut is about two seconds. Um, and then combine that with a sort of beginning, middle, end um, oh, situation, it, 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 people's attention. Right, exactly. That's also true. It's exactly six bars. Yes? Uh, the question is, why do we only support uh, 14 and above, ICS and above? And um, yeah, so the video uh, recording and playback capabilities that we were looking for were not available in the earlier APIs. Um, there were some very specific things that I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, there's a reason that the major video apps out there are for recording are uh, 14 and above. Uh, so the question is, um, are we downloading the same video that, uh, uh, that is being uploaded? So the answer is yes, for the most part. Um, if you have a lower end phone, um, we don't discriminate on having a lower end phone, but we do uh, do some things if you have a bad connection, and we'll download a lower quality file um, if you have a bad connection. Uh, but uh, with a strong connection, everyone's downloading the same file. Um, so there's two questions. One, what do we do for testing? Two, how hard was it to move from Android Studio, uh, sorry, from um, IntelliJ to, or from Ants to Gradle? Um, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, it took me, uh, I did this, I, I, I did this as a cowboy project by myself. It took me two full days to move our entire project from an IntelliJ Ant system to an Android Studio Gradle system. Um, I had my uh, uh, Twitter for Android uh, teammates beside me that I complained to the entire way. And then at the very end of it, I tweeted in all caps, great all, and I was happy. But it took me two days. Um, a lot of Stack Overflow, and um, I was lucky to have the Twitter friend or guys beside me. So the question is, is great all easier? Um, one, of the, one of the things that I like about great all, um, it, it gives you the power to make different kinds of builds very easily. So if you want to you know, create a beta build, you know, change the package names, like whatever, um, it, uh, it allows you to do that easier than in Ant. Uh, Previously, uh, you know, Twitter for Android moved to Gradle recently too. Um, like I don't know, months ago. Someone, someone here can probably correct me, but uh, we did everything in Ant before, and uh, that was pretty good. Um, but uh, things just got the demands on it got so significant that it made sense to move to a system like Gradle. The question is, um, how do we come up with a 250 millisecond um, 
uh, tail at the end of the video, at which point we start seeking to, to, to the front. Um, I so it, it was really just trial and error and what felt best on most phones. Um, anything much bigger than that, uh, you start to notice the cutting off of the end of it. And anything much larger than that, you start to hear the gap. Um, and on most phones, it, it, this was just kind of the best way. You, you should, if you, if you ever walk into the Vine office, which if you guys are in New York, I, I, I you know, send me a note and I'll, I'll give you a tour. It's one room, so it's not a lot to see. But um, we have some video files that we've like found on YouTube or whatever that do things like, you know, they're very annoying. They're just like audio synchronization loop videos that just go on for like 30 minutes of like beep, beep, and then you like try to make sure like, you know, your, the video you're recording is like synchronized to that. And we have uh, certain videos that we use to test like the quality of the loop and stuff like that. And using those test videos, 250 kind of performed the best. Um, but yeah, we walk into the Vine office and people are, are playing this stuff like loud blast everywhere. When I came back to Twitter and I was just, I kind of had like three phones and there was like Vines playing and all of them, I had someone come up to me and be like, hey, you need to, you need to tone that down. It's like really loud. I was like, sorry, I forget that you guys aren't used to the noise. The question is, how did we come up with the test device space? Um, yes, so we use Twitter statistics, we use public statistics. Um, uh, you can, you guys can probably take a guess at what the most popular Android phones are, at least in the U.S. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, the personal phones. So the Motorola Droid Razor, which is not, uh, uh, not necessarily a very popular phone, Vine runs very well on it because it was, it was my phone. <laughs> uh, the question is, how did I use the Twitter for Android code? Um, I copied and pasted it. There was no dependency injection. It was like, oh, I, I could use that list view. I'm going to grab that file. Uh, the question is, are we planning on open sourcing some of the logic? Um, yeah, actually, I had a conversation about that today. So watch, watch the Vine GitHub space. Um, hopefully, stuff to come really soon. Great, cool. thanks. Thank you.